Hello, everyone. I'm just going to start things up here. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you for joining us for today's event, Sounding New Sonic Approaches. Now, to help situate you, we are streaming this to YouTube live from fourth space. And here we are located at unceded Indigenous lands in Chichage, Montreal. In fourth space, we work with our university community to help mobilize knowledge. We co-create daily activities that examine research questions and projects that are in development here at the university, like this one. We're running this event as a live stream Zoom meeting, as we all know, so I won't go over too much about that because this is a pretty unusual setup for us. Uh, but of course, let us you can communicate to us with, in the chat also if there's any questions there um, or through your microphones and cameras. But with that, it's very much my pleasure to hand it over to the editors of uh, New Sonic Approaches and Literary Studies, Jason Camelot, Catherine McLeod. Welcome both of you and over to you. Welcome to Sounding New Sonic Approaches, a live recording session. We are recording this here in fourth space at Concordia University and online on Zoom. And we're here live with an audience. Welcome audience, let's hear a round of applause. The idea of the event today is to create a spoken sound work out of our collective special issue of English Studies in Canada by sounding each article in the form of, of a performed reading, a selection from your written piece in the journal issue, or by selecting surrogate sounds meant to capture something of what was discussed in your article or contribution. The sounds of speech spoken through mics, Zoom, or pre-recorded and played through Zoom will also be played through a variety of speakers in and outside the fourth space. And the sound from those various outputs will also be recorded and sent to a mixing desk where spoken web audio engineer, James Healy, will be capturing everything on multiple tracks via an RME Fireface digital converter for subsequent use in mixing the new Sonic Approaches sound work um, for release as a spoken web podcast episode that Catherine and I aim to produce from this performance. So that's the basic idea. Uh, think of it as a big poetry reading or an open mic collaborative performance of a literary Sonic manifesto of sorts that will be recorded from a variety of sources in multi-track. Special thanks to, Je uh, to James Healy and to Douglas Moffat and the Fourth Space team for assisting in the sound for this event and in creatively imagining how to record it. We have a set list for our readers, which is also the table of contents of the special issue. When it is your turn, please state your name and the name of your article that you are reading from before starting. Please keep it to that and we'll move from one reader to the next. With that, let's start recording. Sounding new sonic approaches, take one. Roll. My name is Jason Camlot. And I'm Catherine McLeod. And we will be reading from... Introduction, new sonic approaches in literary studies. The sound of literature is now discernible as never before. This emerging discernibility inciting new sonic approaches to literature is due in the first instance to digitized audio assets and online environments that make previously analog collections of literary recordings more readily available and useful for research and study. Beyond this important infrastructural condition, the heightened discernibility of sonic approaches to literary culture has arisen from a quite recent interaction and convergence of methods between literary studies and sound studies as a broad interdisciplinary field. Our call for papers for this special issue of English Studies in Canada invited submissions that pursue sound-focused studies of literary works and events and performances, and that explore connections between fields of literary studies and sound studies. From that outset, the literary, 
was an intentionally expansive concept, and that has translated into the formal range of case studies from archival objects to live performances used by the authors of the articles we received and selected for inclusion in this collection. In asking our contributors to think, or rather, in asking our contributors to be thinking sonically, as we put it, we ask them to write from their perspectives as listeners. In other words, we ask them to enact a conflation of literary studies and sound studies to do literary sound studies, and to do so while attending to what it means to be a listener in the context of their discipline. This is Jason Camelot again, and Annie Murray will be joining me. Annie, do you want to say hi? Hi. Darren Wurschler can't be with us today, but we're we three are the co-authors of an article called The Afterlife of Performance. The afterlife of performance is riddled with assumptions about life, death, and time. One major assumption is the possibility of distinction between liveness and something else, not so much death as afterlifeness of various theorizations of media in the age of the zombie. We're not really interested in how particular instantiations of liveness or presence are produced. Rather, we're concerned with the particulars of how the afterlife of performance is produced, managed, and maintained by the application of various cultural techniques. We want to consider how a network of particular people using particular hardware to capture performance in a particular space on particular kinds of storage media combines with specific techniques such as mastering, editing, filing, labeling, holding, i.e. long periods of neglecting, digitizing, remastering, and circulating in order to produce our sense of the relative worth of a recording of another group of particular people chanting, talking, and reading. What we can see in this assemblage, if we examine it closely, is the inner workings of a mechanism that produces literary value. I'm Annie Murray, also reading from The Afterlife of Performance. Only some of the materials that provide evidence of poetic practice in the late 1960s have sometimes crossed the formal archival threshold. Others are ignored, lost, or destroyed. Some, like the Sir George Williams University series, only become a formal institutional record after a chance discovery followed by validation through concerted scholarly and institutional effort. Being attuned to the concept of the archival multiverse helps rationalize the messiness, expanse, duplication, and incompleteness of literary legacy, especially of the eventful kind. And finally, we can see the role the web plays in making archival content both ubiquitous and messy. Thinking in a multiverse way can allow us to layer and intersect poetic events, poets, and their literary and geographical movements, as well as the movement and proliferation of the evidentiary traces of their work. It invites us to gain comfort with a decentralized model of both preservation and dissemination. Next will be Julia Pollock O'Neill. Hi there, I'm Julia Pollock O'Neill. I'm reading from my article, Archives, Intimacy, Embodiment, Encountering the Sound Subject in the Literary Archive. While researching Robertson, meaning Lisa Robertson, at SFU, I inquired about the different media available in their collections that might allow me to better access Robertson's personal feminist networks, a key topic in my work. I'm particularly interested in materials related to poet, curator, and organizer Nancy Shaw, a scholar responsible for many changes in the KSW's operations in terms of its connections to ArtSpeak, a Vancouver artist-run centre. During our time working together, Robertson re repeatedly stressed the importance of looking into Shaw's work within the KSW and Art Speak, and more broadly, given my interest in how KSW intersected with the Vancouver art world and the group's feminist activity, uh, 
Presented with a box of tapes from the Kootenai School of Writing Fonds, also held at SFU, I selected the tapes hand annotated with Robertson's name as well as those of Shaw, which only roughly corresponded with the finding aid. It was explained that the tapes had been annotated somewhat ad hoc over the years. Again, the experience was heightened and singular, made even more so by the privacy of the listening space. Putting on a pair of ear-covering headphones, I pressed play on the first tape and realized it first had to be rewound. All of these attributes served to build momentum for the initial moments of listening to the recording. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear a sound clip of Michael O'Driscoll reading. This essay features a reel-to-reel -reel recording of a 1969 classroom lecture during which Canadian poet and playwright James Rainey demonstrates the practice of sound collage in relation to the production of his celebrated 1967 play, Colors in the Dark. On first encountering the recording, the listener will notice the extraordinarily intrusive presence of a jackhammer located somewhere in the proximity of the classroom. Thanks very much, Ray. Um, I've already <clears throat> given you about a quarter of the reading um, on tape and uh, gramophone, and fortunately, before the jackhammer started, the um, first thing I played was um, from Carl Orff's uh, Music for Children, which uh, he, he starts with nursery rhymes. and. Um, lists of names that children recite, just the names of the kids on the street. And uh, the usual, what used to be called in Canadian schools, choral reading, absolutely horrible. He has made it into uh, something much more spontaneous and uh, delightful. And it's on that that uh, I feel a lot of um, poetry could be based and has been based. Um, then the second thing I played on the tape recorder was from a um, hmm, collage or radio. The whole idea of collage is you take little bits of sound and uh, things you found in anywhere. Piece them together, bits of tin foil, bits of old newspapers, um, piece of plastic you found on the street. It's a principle that's quite familiar now in painting. As a matter of fact, you recall this hour a collage with jackhammer. And um, you can do the same thing in sound. You got a musician and, and somebody with the um, uh, sound effects. Rainey's equanimity in this moment is astounding. One could well imagine cancelling the lecture, especially one focused on attentive listening. Rainey, however, simply absorbs the intrusive jackhammer into the performance of his classroom delivery, adopting or adapting the sonic dissonance into the logic of a lesson already headed towards an appreciation of the affective tension and political force of jarring oral juxtaposition. Mike, would you mind stating your name and, and the title of the talk, of the, of the paper, I should say? Happy to do so, Jason. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael O'Driscoll. And I am a professor of English at the University of Alberta and the director of the Cool Institute for Advanced Study and a governing board member of the Spoken Web Project. My essay was titled, is titled, Collage with Jackhammer, James Rainey, The Art of Noises, and the Paraphonic Sound Collage. Next up, we have Mathieu Aubin. The paper is entitled Listening Queerly for Queer Sonic Resonances in the Poetry Series at Sir George Williams University, 
1966 to 1971. And we'll be listening to a recording. A short history on queer listening. The 1960s and 1970s, listening to and recording queer people from a police perspective was one means of documenting them and regulating their behavior. In the 60s, the RCMP, CIA, and FBI worked together to conduct research on queer people, including queer writers, to monitor their activities. This research involved bugging homes and tapping phone lines, as well as following and trapping queer people by infiltrating their communities. Local and national police forces would collect this information and circulate it across their networks to build cases that would make queer people the target of increased surveillance. But quite the opposite, some queer writers saw listening as a form of homosocial rapprochement. Writers like Ginsberg practiced the tender form of listening to build queer bonds. Rather than being exploitative, tender listening was a way for queer folks to develop relationships by listening to each other's voices orienting themselves toward each other and feeling a sense of solidarity and lived experience. Similarly, some queer writers performed a close listening practice to carefully consider poems' meanings and social potential. More recently, from a queer academic perspective, listening queerly to recorded queer readings engenders opportunities to better understand lived experiences of the time as they were expressed through poetry and discussions of writing. There are more important ethical considerations when listening to recordings that were previously kept in private archives, especially when the recording subjects were not necessarily out. Indeed, queer listening should not be invasive or extractive, and most importantly, should not reproduce the violence that was perpetuated by the police state. Rather, it requires engaging with these recordings with an understanding that they reflect a specific queer time. As Jack Halberstam theorizes in his discussions of queer time, Queer uses of time and space are developed according to other logics of location, movement, and identification, rather than the paradig paradigmatic markers of a heterosexual life model, such as marriage, family, and reproduction. The lived life is not discussed the same way for queer people as it is for heteronormative individuals. And the language used to describe these experiences, including by poets, is shaped by one's experiences of living in a queer time and space. Voicing appropriate Jason Weems, Voicing Appropriations, Sounding Found Poetry in 1960s Canada. Voicing Appropriations, Sounding Found Poetry in 1960s Canada by Jason Weems. The oral performance of found poetry presents a new layer of interpretive complexity to a practice in which appropriation and recontextualization already complicate understandings of voice, origin, and expression. However, there has not been much consideration given, to my knowledge, to the oral performance or audio recordings of found or appropriated poems, either from the historical moment I discuss here or in the contemporary conceptual poetry which is its successor. Similarly, the ethical issues of voice appropriation have been the subject of much recent debate, although without much attention given to the oral performance of appropriative texts. In her book, Appropriate, A Provocation, Paisley Rectal writes, quote, With regard to writing and appropriation, the real question is not whether I can simply ignore or override racial stereotypes, or even whether certain cultures have immutable claims to particular subjects and cont content, what appetites I feed when I write from a position outside my own." Unquote. Rechtel's argument builds upon that made by Claudia Rankin and Beth Lawforda in their introduction to the collection The Racial Imaginary, Writers on Race in the Life of the Mind, who argue we must shift our thinking about cultural appropriation in terms of rights to thinking about it in terms of desire. Quote, what is the charisma of what I feel estranged from, and why might I wish to enter and inhabit it? I speak not in terms of prohibition and rights, but desire." Unquote. These appetites and desire implicate both writer and audience in the ethical questions around appropriation, an implication which takes on further significance when listening to audio recordings of live readings, in which a writer's performance and an audience response are partially recorded, as I hope to demonstrate below. I want here to situate the emergence of found or appropriated poetics in Canada in the 1960s compare oral readings of such work at the time, 
and consider the differences in how we might hear these readings over 50 years later from how they may have been heard by contemporary audiences, further complicating some of the ethical questions raised by the oral voicing of a form that already speaks with two voices. My name is Clara Duplessis. I'm reading from Do You Read Me? Kai Kello, The Words and Music Show, and a self-curated series within a series. In fact, I'm not reading from my essay. Instead, I am reading from a handwritten scan included in the essay. The scan is called Word Sound System 1, Part A, and is included within Kai Kello's 2010 poetry collection, Maple Leaf Rag. Notes to the scan read, pronounce each letter individually. Notes also read, letters indicated by an accent and a number should be stressed to emphasize rhythm. Repeat until rhythmic pattern understood. D O U D O Y D O Y O U R E A D M E D O U D O Y O U R E A D M E D O Y O U R E A D M E D O Y O U R E A D M E D O Y O U R E A D M E D O Y O U R E A D M E Notes read Each component in the logical continuation of the previous and sorry, the notes are confusing. Each component in the log logical continuation of the previous, and once they are strung together, they form a tidy loop that can repeat infinity. Thanks, Clara. That's the first cover of a Kai Kello sound poem that I've ever heard. Next, we're going to hear uh, an audio clip from Kate Moffat, Candace Sharon, and Michelle Levy, who co-authored a contribution called Modeling the Audio Edition with Mavis Gallant's 1984 reading of Grip and Poche. The rationale of copy text most closely aligns with the impulse to focus on the story in our audio edition, rather than the artifact or the event. And in some respects, audio might present some advantages. A story read by its author might clarify ambiguities through intonation or help select the most authoritative version of a text. In this case, our copy text was the story as Gallant performed it on 14th of February, 1984, a version that clearly had her seal of approval. Producing the two podcast episodes required listening to Gallant reading dozens of times, and in doing so, Moffat noticed one of Gallant's asides in particular, a moment near the end of the recording, where she deviates from the story to say, I, I have an editorial query here. Is he imagining this? Yes. <laughs> These are proofs. During a question and answer session to celebrate the first episode's release, we discussed this reference to elusive proofs. Following that event, SFU professor Carol Gerson informed us that the proofs for this story, as well as a cassette copy of the 1984 reading, were held by the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. With help from Roma Kale, a librarian at Victoria University, we were able to access scans and determine that they were the same proofs Gallant had been reading from. On page 24, her editor adds an interlinear pencil notation between lines six and seven. Is he imagining this? Just as Gallant had read aloud in 1984. For speech recordings, sound. Victoria Roscombe's Listening Queerly to Teleny and Trilby. Next up, Kelly Barron. 
I'm Kelly Barron, and I'm reading from Oral Memory in Madeline Tan's Do Not Say We Have Nothing. In the opening pages of Madeline Tan's Do Not Say We Have Nothing, a novel that considers the intergenerational trauma resulting from the cultural revolution in uh, Chinese-Canadian communities, Li Ling, the novel's protagonist, is walking through Vancouver's Chinatown when she hears Bach's sonata for piano and violin number no. four from the speakers of a store. She feels, quote, as drawn towards it as keenly as if someone were pulling her by hand. The counterpoint, holding together composer, musicians, and even silence. The music, with its spiraling waves of grief and rapture, was everything she remembered. The result is that she recalls her father when, in the moments of listening to Bach, he became, quote, so alive, so beloved, that the incomprehensibility of his suicide grieved her all over again. By her own admission, she had never before experienced such a pure me memory of her father, Zhang Kai, in the two decades since his death. Li Ling's experience in Vancouver's Chinatown raises important, uh, important questions for the role of music in studying literary depictions of intergenerational memory and trauma. What role does music have in understanding memory recall for such novels? How can listening to the music of these novels expand our understandings of trauma and memory recall? In this article, I posit that listening in a literary context provides a methodology for understanding intergenerational memory and trauma. The sensory experiences which accompany the scenes of trauma that I analyze are defined by a rhythmic repetition and music, resulting in a distinctly sonic approach to intergenerational memory and trauma that can be identified well in the visceral descriptions of glass, uh, classical music in the novel. Resultingly, I want to suggest that listening to the music of Do Not Say We Have Nothing is indicative of a new method for identifying intergenerational memory. One focused both on literary depictions of sound and how that sound then influences the next generations of a family. If traumatic memories are communicated by silences and gaps in declarative or narrative memory, then the sensory stimulus of sound becomes the conduit by which traumatic memories are passed down to future generations of a family. Unable to join us today is Katerina Furholzer, who contributed an article called Noisy Nuisance, Chris Ireland's Aphasic Poetry. Next will be Daniel Martin. Uh, D D Daniel Martin, uh, oh, my God. essay <clears throat> is called... Girl with the piercings? Yeah. What the hell were you doing with her? It's not what you think. Daniel Martin, uh, The Child's Stuttering Mouth and the Ruination of Language in Jordan Scott's Blurt and Shelley Jackson's Riddance. How do we read and write about the enigmatic experiences of people who actually stutter without succumbing to metaphor, stigma, or valorization of the creative stuttering inherent in all textualities? We put aside our critical methodologies that expose the tensions between voice and text in literary expression and imagine the experiences of children who stutter through playful and experimental fantasies of language devourment and ruination. Despite their differences in genre, one a celebrated work of Canadian sound poetry, the other an experimental text by an innovator in the rise of hypertext or found document fiction, both Jordan Scott's Blurt and Shelley Jackson's Riddance reimagined stuttered speech outside of the prosaic deconstruction of voice text, presence absence, fluent disfluent, that has informed so much of critical study of literary voicings. Both examine what it means to return, in Scott's words, to the fact of the mouth. These are texts that do not simply romanticize the stutter inherent in all language systems, nor do they playfully deconstruct the critical binaries of speech, text, presence, absence, and phonemic phonetic that informs most accounts of the voice in literature. Our critical and theoretical methodologies have grounded our study of literary voices in such binaries, but there are other ways of reimagining our romanticization of communicative breakdowns. Scott and Jackson both reorient readers' responses away from a logic of extractive meaning toward an invitation to participate in the childlike pleasures of, 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 of devouring, ingesting, and ruining language, 
and the accompanying traumas, aches, and longings that are inevitable in such pleasure. They experiment with playful accounts of various de devices, te techniques, and tricks that modern speech experts have introduced under the biomedical demand for cure and management. Both raise profound questions about the history of speech language therapy and the cultural history of the stutter as a haunted and haunting presence, both irre irremediably internal and external to the speaking mouth. Fundamentally, both understand the act of speaking or reading fluently as something other than triumph for people who stutter. Reading evokes a threat in the relationship between speaker and language. The stutter is a threat of, of undoing. It creates a hole that swallows up even the binary distinctions that we often hold on to in the search for meaning. Sometimes that hole becomes a portal to other dimensions and voices. Other times it's just a giant mouth ingesting language and destroying meaning, threatening everything like a child's gleeful indulgences. These are texts that introduce a sense of disfluent joy in the actual embodied experience of the stutterer's ruinous relationship to words. Next is Kristen Smith. Hello, I'm Kristen Smith. I'm so grateful to be able to voice aloud an excerpt from Unsounded, a new method for processing non-linguistic poetry. The comparison of a non-linguistic poem to a graphic score emphasizes the openness of the art form for the reader. The poem as score also foregrounds the reader's roles as a performer and interpreter of the poem. However, the poem's material does not give any more guidance in executing either of those roles. At every turn, with each suggested paradigm for assessment, non-linguistic poems resist. Non-linguistic poetry rejects a totalizing method for reading and unsounding. In No Medium, Frank Dworkin performs close readings of unfilled pages that are erased blank or seemingly silent. In his analysis of Cages 433, Dworkin asserts, silence is always ideal and illusory. Silence is a thought experiment, provocative and unverifiable. Unsounds are filled with possibilities for interpretation and semantic meaning. This essay has specifically examined works that are not blank yet still eliminate linguistic material and prevent sounding. These texts are comprised of unsound. Dworkin presses further to suggest that in such works, medium is as unrealizable as silence. Non-linguistic poems subvert expectations of medium or category. Moreover, such creative works comprised of unsound compel readers to new reading practices. Soltz's Moonshot Sonnet, Bergball's Drift, and Schmaltz's Surfaces each require the reader to meet it at the page and actively work through it on its own terms. In encountering a non-linguistic poem, the reader is required to question their relationship to reading, to sound, and to communication. Resisting any singular method for reading and interpretation, these non-linguistic poems demonstrate that both sounding and even the resistance to sound, unsound, can communicate multivalent, albeit oftentimes elusive, messages. Yet, these communications are incomplete without the reader processing, perhaps through unsounding, the poetic material. The reader is essential to the visual poem's communication. The reader is integral to the poem's becoming. Now we're going to hear from the Reader's Forum on Disciplinary Listening. This is Jason Camlot. And this is Catherine McLeod. And we'll be reading from Forum on Disciplinary Listening, an introduction. We have developed this forum to invite further reflection of this kind from experts who have worked with sound in and across a variety of disciplines of study. We asked, 
how has your discipline taught you to listen? What does listening mean within your disciplines? How do you understand sonic approaches in relation to disciplinarity? What aspects of sound studies as an interdisciplinary field do you translate, transpose into the approaches you take as a researcher and teacher within a more specific discipline of knowledge and university department? Now we invite you to listen to this forum as a conversation and to consider what you would write in response to these same questions. Notice the constellations of listeners evoked, the resonances in reflections. Immerse yourself in the listening that each writer educes on the page. This is Jason Camelot again, reading from my short article, towards a history of literary listening. The story of literary listening may tell of two long lasting concurrent desires of literary encounter. One desire seeks to embrace literature as something that best lends itself to apprehension through methods of sounding and listening. The other seeks to extricate sound and listening and perhaps by extension, the intimacy of other kinds of exchange and, communi and communication that involve presence from the scenario of literary study. The latter desire to extricate sound and listening from the scenario of literary study seems particularly disciplinary in its motivation as the extrication is sought to remove sources of damage and corruption to literary appreciation to the extent that literary criticism may justifiably claim its status as a legitimate discipline of knowledge with established principles of literary judgment. It may be that an interesting technique for contemporary literary listening can be discovered through acts of listening that ride the contradictions of this concurrence, insofar as these contradictory desires are localized manifest manifestations of more abstract critical desires to hear the past in the present, to feel presence in absence, to know and feel the literary as it is here and now, as it was and as it will be. Brandon LaBelle, Poetics of Listening. Next, we're gonna hear from Tanya E. Clement, Distant Listening and Resonance. It's a recording. For speech recordings, sound is text. The words people speak, but also other sounds that indicate a speaking and listening context. Tone and laughter, coughing and crying, bird song, car engines and horns, a baby crying, thunder clapping, gunshots, the needle dropping, the needle scratching, to name a few. Using computation to analyze many texts at once in big data sets has been called distant listening in digital humanities literature. I have described distant listening to sound texts as using computing to quote, distill the many layered four dimensional space of the text in performance, i.e. embodied within the performance network of interpretations with the listener in time and space into a two-dimensional script called code. Distant listening, like distant reading, implies a lack of granular observation based on proximity in terms of space, as well as a removal in terms of emotion, experience, and individual or subjective knowledge. Yet sound travels differently, and what is lacking is made up for in other ways. What is too close can be deafening. What is far can be communicated loud and clear. As both a physical property and a cultural hermeneutic, resonance serves as a useful theory for articulating how distant listening can make meaning differently. Next, we have Kim Fox and Reem Almagrabi. And Kim, would you like to say hello and read your title to start off? Sure, I can do that. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to join you all, though it is 11.43 in Cairo. Reem and I have an essay. It's called 
Reflections on Evaluating Soundscapes and Gathering Sounds in Cairo, the case of the AUC Diaries Project. So it is now 10.30 a.m. and I should probably open the curtains to see what the weather is like. Well, it's raining heavily and the sky is extremely dull. What a depressing way to start the day. Time to make my everyday morning coffee, which consists of an espresso shot and a bit of lactose-free foamed milk and no sugar, super basic. I tend to get really bad headaches when I skip my morning coffee dose. I also get super grumpy, so let's try and avoid that. It's 6.30 a.m. and I must get up for my 8.30 class at AC. The sound of the alarm which I snooze over and over again is not enough to get me out of bed. That's why I always leave the curtains open. I don't like getting up this early. I don't like it one bit. In fact, I hate it. You know what? Maybe I'll just skip today's morning class. I'm too tired. Nah, I need the grade. What I do slightly appreciate about this pre-8.30 class morning ritual is it's peaceful and silent because everyone's still asleep. Anyways, I grab my things and head out to a busy Thursday. I stare at the usual pictures of my classmates and the black screens with names at the bottom left corner as I listen to the lecture. <sighs> the professor just gave us an assignment. So I write it down in my bullet journal, my calendar, and on a sticky note that I put up on the wall. Organization is the only thing keeping me afloat this semester. Otherwise, I'd get nothing done. My desk is probably my favorite place to be. The best way I could describe it is if a crazy wizard started hoarding objects that he collected from his many journeys. I have stickers up on my wall, art from my favorite artists, tech gadgets, makeup, accessories. Honestly, anything of interest to me is probably somewhere on my desk. Minute 63, Egypt scores. But then Congo ties a score in minute 87. We need one goal to qualify. With two minutes left, it felt hopeless. People walked out, but then... Minute 94. Muhammad Salah scores in a moment that will go down in Egyptian history. My microphone couldn't handle the reaction. It wasn't any tamer on the streets either. It didn't look like I could drive home tonight, so I decided to sleep over at Andrews. Kristen Mariah, that might that men might listen earnestly to it, hearing blackness. Next, we're going to hear from Mara Mills and Andy Slater. First, Mara, and then a recording. Andy is also here. If you want to put us both on screen. Oh yeah, please do. I'll wait for Andy to join me. Can someone add Andy to the screen or is he here? We'll get him up there. Andy, are you, yeah. can you ask Andy if he can share his camera? Andy, can, do you want to be on screen with me? I'll begin. Mara Mills and Andy Slater, blind mode, blind listening techniques. I'm Mara Mills, a media studies professor and historian of electroacoustics and disability, and my co-author, Andy Slater, is a blind sound artist who records, transcribes, and otherwise documents blind listening techniques, or what Andy calls blind mode. I first learned about Andy's work when I was researching the history of the C1 cassette player. 
This machine was released by the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled in the United States in 1981, and it included a time-stretching or pitch restoration feature so that blind people could speed read talking books without distorting a narrator's voice. To my surprise, this tape player, which is no longer in production, still has a fan base in noise and other experimental music scenes. And Andy uses sounds from the C1, among many other access tools, old and new, in his compositions. And we'll hear a recording of that now. Then all us tape decks and the eight RPM record players were ugly and bulky. They were meant for home use, out of sight from embarrassment. There was a stigma attached to them, much like large print books and the white cane itself. None of us knew the glory of the talking book players. Everything could sound weird if we let it. Reading is fundamental, but any Paul Anka song could sound like sword fighting to at the chromatic dragon on those players. This is how many of us discovered that sound itself can be an alternative to photographs and paintings. These tools purposely ugly so no one would want to steal them were also phenomenal noisemakers. Antiquities of blind culture and not that different from contemporary assistive tech, both can be used creatively and can annoy and disrupt. When learning at speed constantly, phones talk aloud, what detectors double as theremins and object recognition apps are always wrong. Blind folks can process multiple sound sources at once because of our use of this tech. When you compose and perform using these tools as instruments, filling the room with blind people's sounds and requesting attention from all who hear it, you're most likely making some people uncomfortable and anxious. It's usually the motive of any noise artist, but in my case it's deconstructing my own culture and using to all's made specifically for me. But it gives more meaning to the art and experience. It's political and anti and not just some noise bros showing off their thrift store find. <laughs> Thank you, Mara and Andy. Unable to be with us today, Nicole Brittingham Furlong, whose article was entitled Apprentices of Listening, Sound Studies in Education Leadership. Next, we're going to hear from Nina Sun Eichheim and Juliet Belloc. Listening te techniques are naturalized within an area of study. In the peer lab, or the practice-based experimental epistemology research lab, which I started a few years ago, we seek to listen to the way different people and different fields listen and to understand more about the way the world appears through specific listening techniques. One of my main collaborators is the graphic designer Juliette Belloc, and we took the invitation to the volume as an opportunity for me to learn more about her listening practices. And the piece we did together is called What They Say Is What They Mean, Listening to Someone's Story. I started by asking uh, Juliet, what is, the, what is listening for a graphic designer? As a graphic designer, I agree to not be the single author of the content of my work. Graphic design in my practice means sharing content. I place myself in a situation where I get to translate something I've heard, understood or seen or reconfigured. And so that means that I have a voice, I am an author, but there is a co-author as well. It can be a client or a community. So listening is essential. As you know, besides working with the peer lab, I mainly work with architects in the making of spaces. And the key question when we visit a space or when we meet with people is, what are their stories? Listening is our primary tool and resource. 
do you listen similarly or differently from architects or even from other graphic designers? And if so, how do these kinds of listenings come together? I do think that I listen differently than some other designers because my primary goal is not to resolve people's problems, which is a big part of what graphic design is and can do. My job now is to catch something in the air, make it visible for all of us to see if that becomes something that can participate in the culture and to transcribe or crystallize ideas that are there for all of us. If I do not listen well, I have nothing to make. Does that make sense? It does. But I'm just wondering if listening is like a metaphor for all of the ways you absorb things. It's not a metaphor. It's note taking and research to make sure we heard well. It's cross checking information to make sure that what people meant was what we heard. It's a lot of trying to find out what group stories are before producing anything visual or graphic. It's a kind of listening that is meant to participate in something alive. So we have to listen in a way that is hopefully, when we do it well, non-intrusive, not orienting the story, letting people say what they would like to say authentically, and then understanding it in the right context before finally proposing something that can participate in the culture it comes from. So it is listening as a way to circumvent assumed knowledge. Thank you. Thank you both so much for that. Next, Gaskia Uzunian, counter listening. And next, here on the Zoom, Ellen Waterman. My piece reflected on a research creation project with deaf culture artists spill propagation. It's called reorienting audition through bodily listening in place. The practice I'm calling bodily listening in place requires something akin to what Natasha Myers and Joe Dumit have called improvising in a state of mid embodiment. Writing about the interactive practices and responsive bodies of scientists engaging with experimental media and communicating their findings through narrative and embodied gesture, Myers and Dumit observe that new insights and forms of dexterity are acquired in the process. Their concept of the responsive excitability of bodies is used to account for how it is that experimentalists acquire new kinesthetic, affective, and conceptual dexterities as they engage in the process of learning to see, feel, and know. Their description matches my embodied experience. I'm learning all over again how to listen. Of course, Myers and Dumit's article is implicitly ableist. It assumes a hearing, seeing, mobile subject, and in that respect, it is like most writing about music, sound, and listening. We need to account for the complexities of working across deaf and hearing music cultures, and what I'm attracted to is precisely what can be learned in this reciprocal intercultural encounter. For example, my work with spill propagation has made me attuned to vibrations seen and felt with an intensity that I've never experienced in five decades of making music in all kinds of environments. When I listened to music through the vibrotactile vest, I can only discern a generalized buzzing and rhythmic thumping. My haptic sense, it seems, is woefully undeveloped. What does it mean to acquire dexterity in a sensory mode? Or better, what does it mean to adopt an intersensory approach to listening that encompasses multiple possible sensory modes? And what happens when we foreground interdependence as a valid and precious ground for musical creativity? These questions animate my desire to reorient audition through bodily listening in place. Thank you, Ellen. And we're gonna close this reading from the Special Issue of English Studies in Canada with Catherine McLeod, Archival Listening. This is Catherine McLeod reading from Archival Listening. Archival listening is listening to archives while reflecting on how you are listening and how you intend to share what you have heard. 
Archival Listening listens with that feature listener in mind. Archival listening is a practice of attending to the archival apparatus holding the sound. While you were away, I held you like this in my mind. Archival listening is hearing the body in time. Archival listening is situating oneself as a listening body in time. Archival listening understands that there are limits of knowing and makes room for what it cannot be heard to. Archival listening takes time. We want to remember what the archive seems to remember. Archival listeners are removed from the time and space of a recorded event, but having heard its sound, a new memory of that event is formed and the feeling of hearing it remains. That ends our recording. Thank you all for listening. Before, first of all, Catherine, I want to thank you all for joining and participating in this uh, little recording session. Before we go, um, we, we since we have you all here, can we gather a little bit more sound from you? We were thinking that it might be nice um, and this might this might feel a little bit 1921, sort of mid-pandemic, what I'm going to ask of you right now. But um, if you would be willing for the for 20 seconds to um, work on the word sounding, so essentially just play with the word sounding for 20 minutes in what other, whatever registers. 20 seconds. What did I say? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be over the next 20 minutes. Just like you know, 20 seconds of of sounding. Um, and if you want to walk around your room and do it, I mean, essentially, we want to gather some textures of sound on that. On and that we, in this room, might walk around the room while saying it. Yeah. So if you don't see us for a bit, it's because everything is mic'd here. So we're going to get different ways of saying it. Um, we'll get st we'll start it off because, you know, it may always be a little bit embarrassing to make weird sounding, 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 sound. sounding, sounding, sounding. <laughs> Sounding. 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 Thanks, everyone. All right, you can, I, now that your mics are off, just clap, let's hear your clapping too. Thanks everybody for joining and for your contribution. Uh, this is just the beginning of the process. So now we're gonna take some of this sound and, and work with it and we'll share it along the way uh, and also ask for your permission to use whatever you've read today in it once we do something with it. Thanks everyone. Thank Great you. to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you everyone. <clears throat> New Sonic Approaches team, for everyone participating. We're gonna close up the Zoom and the live stream, but just remember that this is still available on our YouTube channel if you wanna revisit it there. Um,